This episode is brought to you by Summer School Electronics. With pedals like the Snow Day Delay, the Pep Rally Fuzz, the Trash Panda, and my personal favorite, the Science Fair, which is two classic dirt pedals in one with a mid-boosted overdrive on one side, a black lab rat circuit on the other, and a blend knob to blend between them to find the perfect classic stacked dirt sound you're looking for, it's hard not to find something you'll love. Mark builds all of his pedals by hand in Syracuse, New York, where he also works as a full-time educator. In addition to the super fun graphics on their pedals, Mark also offers custom artwork. Want your dog's face on a pedal? He can do it. Want your face on a pedal? He can make that happen too. Go over to summerschoolelectronics.com and make sure to tell them that 40 Watt Podcast sent you. Hello and welcome, 40 Waters. Welcome back to another episode of 40 Watt Podcast. My name is Philip. I am your host. Uh, I'm excited to be here today. Look at y'all. I didn't say I'm super excited or super pumped. I say super a lot, so I'm trying to get better. I, I think I negated the benefits of not saying it by mentioning it, though. Um, so here we are again, another episode of 40 Watt Podcast. This week, I'm super excited to have uh, to be joined by David from Great Eastern Effects. How are you, sir? Very good, thank you. Very happy to be here. I'm I'm very glad you could be here. Uh, we've been chatting for it's been a little bit, a little bit before Nam, <coughs> and uh, I can be really bad at email sometimes. And it took us a little while to get connected, but been uh, we we talked, we chatted a little bit, and they were like, "We gotta have, we gotta do an episode together," because. Uh, I had discovered your pedals um, by talking to Joe Branton over at the Guitar sure, Nerds podcast. Sure. I love Joe. I love Matt. I love those. Uh, I love being a guest on that podcast. Um, and they're constantly raving about your stuff. So Joe connected us that we needed to talk. And uh, I've been checking out one of your pedals. We'll get to that at some point um, in the in this podcast. But how are you today? Great. Yeah, it's um, it's evening for me. Sunday evening. So I've had a very domestic weekend with family away from pedals and I'm I'm ready for Monday I'm ready to go back to work <laughs> oh gosh I am so not ready no <laughs> thankfully as we're recording this it's over a holiday weekend yeah. and I don't have to go to work on Monday so I'm not ready for Tuesday which I already refer to as second Monday so yeah do you know what increasingly I find I need I need time away from thinking about uh guitars and pedals and overdrive all the time because there's a when you're a one a one person company, which I I am most of the time, it's super intense. And I'm you know I wake up in the morning, I'm thinking about pedals. I go to sleep at night, thinking about pedals. And um, it's really it's really good for me to have uh, weekends where I don't do any of that stuff, and then can come back and um, and uh, feel feel some uh, some joy for it, some excitement for it again. Yeah, I think no matter what you do for a living. Um, or for a hobby, sometimes you just need to take a break from it to still enjoy it because you, you get so wrapped up in everything that, that it just starts to take over every moment of your life. And you're like, I'm burned out. Yeah. I'm completely tired. There, um, there have been points where, you know, towards the end of developing the, the focus phase, the first pedal that we do, um, I just, I just was so sick of, of listening to for minute differences in uh, distortion, guitar distortion, that I just had to go home and listen to like, uh, you know, flute music or classical music or, or like <laughs> electronic dance music or just anything that wasn't, uh, you know, loud guitars, which I really love. But um, you have to, you have to kind of rest those those bits of you every now and again. Otherwise, you can't hear it anymore. It's just, um, yeah. Yeah, it, it's like um, if you've ever been and done like a, a wine or bourbon tasting or something like that, they'll they'll tell you, especially when. Um, so I toured the Jack Daniels distillery once in Tennessee and they they do a single barrel uh, sour mash whiskey. You can buy the whole barrel if you want. <laughs> I think it fills something like 200 some odd, you know, 750 milliliter bottles. Um, for um, for you Americans that don't want to do milliliters, that's a fifth. It's essentially. I've, I've never known what that is, but oh. now I know. Yeah, yeah. This is essentially, a fifth of a gallon is the it. The math doesn't actually quite work out, but that's the <laughs> yeah. 
not a math podcast. Good, because I'm not the mathematician to be explaining because I am going to get it wrong. But they they talk about when if you go to the distillery and you and you want to buy now, you have to still buy it the way, you know, liquor laws work. You have to buy it through your local liquor store. But if you're close enough, you can go to the distillery, sample a couple of barrels and pick which barrel is going to be yours. And they tell you, you know, when you taste it, don't actually swallow it. Don't drink. Spit it out. Because if you do and you do that too often, it just all tastes the same. Like you're just going <laughs> to taste the same to everyone. I get that way about overdrives a lot. Yeah. Where if I'm listening to too many back and forth, back and forth, they just, it sounds like an overdrive. Yeah. 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 I get, I get just inundated with it yeah there's somebody oh, I, it's terrible that i can't remember but i saw somebody on youtube made some great videos uh where they were kind of brave enough to actually say you know do do all overdrive sound the same and, and put things next to each other and i think it's a really it's a really valid question uh i mean obviously it you know people often say about fuzzes if, you, if you're not into fuzz then they all kind of sound the same and if you're into fuzz the differences really matter, and that's definitely true. Um, but it's yes. it's it's a question of degrees, isn't it? There's um, uh, well, I mean, what do you think? Is the, the the other the other thing people say about ta- like tasting um, wine or go, you know, going to distilleries or, or wineries, like you can you go you go to the south of France to this amazing vineyard, and you know the the sun's just just um, going down over the hill and they, they sit you down under a tree and they bring you a glass of this wine and it's it's the best thing you've ever tasted in your life. And you buy like <coughs> four cases and um, just <laughs> strap the back of your car down, you drive home and then you, you open a bottle on a rainy Wednesday night in uh, February and you're like, yeah, this is really, this is really ordinary. <laughs> I don't know what I was thinking. So <laughs> I don't know what the equivalent would be. If you, if you went to a guitar store and, and they set you up in a, beautiful room with with like a beautiful amp and a guitar and you know i think it's not even us playing i think it's the concept like we hear our favorite guitar players play something and you know they're one if you're hearing them on the record or you're hearing them even live where it's been rehearsed and ready and that's their sound that's the way they play it's how it reacts to them all those all those factors we all talk about all the time You've just heard it in its ideal setting for someone else. That doesn't mean that when you use it, it's going to sound with your guitar, your hands, your amp, it's going to sound at all like you thought it sounded. Yeah, unfortunately. Uh, so, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, my hands, I uh, I was I was at a buddy's house in Chicago and we um, we were real curious. And so we all passed a guitar around and all played the same riff. And it was interesting to be playing same guitar, same amp, nothing changed except who was playing it, and to hear the tonal changes in hand. Yes. Yeah. Oh, just by itself. Yeah. I remember years ago, um, John Priest, who who runs a guitar store here called Peach Guitars, um, and he, he's a yeah. he's a, a big big um, SRV guy, and uh, I remember chatting to him about guitars, and he was saying you know, everything I pick up, people just say it sounds like a strap because he'll just kind of rip into Stevie Ray stuff. And um, and he showed me it's kind of true. <laughs> he kind of, he could make everything sound a bit like a strap. <laughs> but that the thing you say about records, it's, it's something I've, I've really got to be in my bonnet about the fact that we, uh, the reference points we use for guitar tone, for how we want to sound, the sound we have in our head, is generally it's a record so it's yeah. it's someone in a studio um with an engineer and uh what even you may not even know the guitar and amp they're using you know all those stories about um you know jimmy page as telecaster has sold more les pauls than 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 any les paul out there you know what i mean and and yep. you so that so the sound the sound that we love is the recorded sound and the pictures we have is of the live stage. So we see Jimmy Page with a Les Paul in front of a stack of Marshalls. And then on the record, he's using a Telecaster and like a little Supra amp or whatever it is. Uh, and not just that, it's a little Supra amp with a microphone in front of it and another one in the room probably. And a you know, beautiful desk, preamp, compressor, all this stuff. And the mix, you know, don't forget the, you know, 
that what the bass player is doing that, that works in harmony with, with the guitar, but all this stuff. Right. And, um, and then we make our gear choices based on the live stuff. Do you know what I mean? We, we, we want the recorded sound, but we, we make, we make live sound choices. And, um, right. It's, it's such, it's such a big thing that, that, um, that we're all guilty of. I mean, it's, it's so easy to do, but, but it's something to, that, that really is worth being aware of. We'll be right back. This podcast is supported in part by String Joy Strings. I'm a snob, at least that's what people tell me. I'm never okay with good enough, and that's where String Joy Strings come in. They're better than good enough. They're the best. String Joy are making some of the finest strings available today right up the road from me in Nashville, Tennessee. They offer custom sets, balanced tension, coded strings, the works. If you need it, they can probably make it happen. You should be using Stringjoy Strings, and if you're going to order from them, you really could help this podcast out by clicking the affiliate link down in the description or show notes below. You get amazing strings, I get a little bit of that back to help the show keep going. It's a win-win situation. Get your Stringjoy Strings today. Yeah, I it I've talked about this before and like especially in the rise of things like um uh, Kemper and Helix and you know the the quad cortex and that kind of stuff, and it's and my statement has always been, oh, it sounds like recorded guitar sound. It it just does, mm-hmm. even even through a speaker on stage of you know full range uh, speaker, it sounds like recorded guitar tone, and that's not what I'm used to playing. Yes. That doesn't feel right. It doesn't sound yeah. right. I'm used to hearing the guitar into the amplifier, not guitar into the amplifier into a mic into a pre into a compressor into an eq mixed in a record Uh, when i play live i know what a guitar sounds like live and what to get the best out of it but i hear those kinds of units like i i used line six as my listeners know for a while i used a a helix and the two full range cabinets and and played that way and it just it sound it had a sheen it was it was like sheen sheen is the word isn't it yeah yeah. And and to me it gets weird. It's not that that's a bad thing. That's not necessarily a bad thing, but we're we're wanting to make live recorded guitar sounds and then by the time you turn around and record those sounds or it just feels like there's a lot of layers that go on top of it that get away from the actual sound of a guitar into an amplifier. Yeah. Yeah. It I don't know. That's a soapbox for me that I'm trying to stay <laughs> off of, but I'm on it again. Um, they they sound fine. Yeah, they do. Yeah. So so David, let's back up a little sure. bit. We just we just jumped into talking. <laughs> but, so how'd you get how'd you get into guitar? How'd you get into music? How'd you get into being of what I my listeners know I affectionately call the lunatics that build That's pedals right. because you're all That's lunatics right. for wanting to get into this. Um, how'd you get into it all? Well, originally I was uh, a um, a writer, I worked for um, Sound on Sound magazine, which is a studio recording magazine here in the UK. And that was my first sort of real job um, out of university. Uh, and then uh, I went to work for a guitar magazine called Guitar Buyer, where I was the editor for about four years. So that was really my my sort of introduction to um, to, to the industry, really. And, um, and a pretty good one. I mean, Back then, print magazines were still just about a thing. This is sort of starting early noughties, um, and for about ten years, that was that was that was what I was doing. So you, you still you still people would pick up the phone to you, and um, you would uh, get flown to go to trade shows and go and meet people, and um, it was it was a pretty cool thing for a twenty something um, kid to to get a chance to do and um the the what i like most about it was was really meeting the people who were making things so meeting uh amp designers uh people making acoustic guitars um and electric guitars and uh, i mean the the um the business side of it was never that interesting to me and um you know you you have to also sit through a lot of um press conferences announcing stuff that you're not remotely interested in but for the chance to a yeah 
I was going to say, I've ranted about uh, the the influencer culture pretending to be excited about things they don't care about yeah. and like the, the frustrating uh, nature of it. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but yeah, getting, getting to, getting to kind of talk to people um, who, who, who are really, really knowledgeable and um, you could just ask them anything. And, uh, and that was a really amazing education as was, actually having to write sometimes you know f- four five six reviews a month of um different bits of gear and and similarly you know i got really sick of of reviewing um mid-range to to um budget uh gear uh all of which was great all of which was you know well no all of which was fine it's absolutely fine yeah. and um but there's nothing like um having to do that um, you know, six times a month to, to really, um, I think I was pretty much cured of, of my, um, gas, uh, by the end of it. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, for all, for all of that was hard work. Uh, you know, I also got sent amazing stuff to play, amazing amps, amazing guitars. Again, stuff I never, uh, you know, I, I might've had a chance to go into a music shop and play that stuff, but never to kind of just have it sent to me. And I could take it home and, and or go and gig with it, um, you know, play with this stuff. So that was a really amazing experience. Um, but I was pretty burned out after 10 years. Uh, it was getting tougher and tougher. The, the industry was completely changing um, because of YouTube. I mean, even the kind of social media stuff that's so dominant now was, was really not such a big factor then but youtube was clearly coming um i mean people were still if you can believe this coming to terms with the is the existence of the internet and what that meant for print magazines which <laughs> feels like another you know uh 100 years ago or something yeah it, but um right yeah yeah I, th- I think of i think of the 90s when uh the music the music industry not the musical instrument industry the music industry had to come to grips with the existence of the internet and the ease with which uh, it now made uh, basically stealing music, you know, yeah. how, how it made it so easy that needed to find a way to combat it. Yes. And there's, there's some arguments being made. They didn't maybe combat it the way they should have. Yeah. Um, as, as a librarian, I actually see the way it's happening in the publishing industry, like in the print industry, uh, on book side, um, because, uh, for example, listeners, if you go to your public library and you sign up for their service, maybe they've got Overdrive or Libby or maybe even Hoopla, whatever service they've got where you could get ebooks through them. Those ebooks, I just I just bought some from my library uh, this week. A a book that would have cost maybe twenty dollars on the shelf to buy the book that the library can then circulate to get an ebook copy of it. It's like $80 and four times the price. And on top of that, they've got it set so that uh, even though it's digital, only one person can use it at a time. And after 48 months, you don't own that book anymore. Mm. And so the publishing industry still doesn't even know how to handle the existence yeah. of the internet. So yeah. Uh, I, I think that's really fascinating to hear someone who was in magazines at the time because I just remember watching all my favorite magazines disappear. Yeah, that's exactly what happened. And I mean, the crazy thing is when I went in as a, um, you know, 20, 21 year old, um, they were, uh, they still had a lot of the archive stuff was on large format film. You know, digital photography was a new thing that was putting so there used to be these scanning houses so you 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 you'd photograph do your product photography on on large format film you go to the scanning house someone would have to manually turn it into a digital image um remove all the the hairs and specks of dust and and within a few years those guys were were just not needed they were out of business yeah um and you know when i when i started it was kind of um if you take that that's that spell from 2000 to 2010 at the beginning of that time, the the music industry is at its kind of all time high point in terms of the money made from selling records, and at the end of that period, the music industry is is 
absolutely terrified <laughs> and and Napster yeah. is here and you know all this stuff is happening but um yeah uh, not I was not you know super aware of all this stuff uh that whole period I just was aware that I had a deadline every month and I had a right. 305 page magazine whatever it was to 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 get out um yeah which was which was really full on but but amazing I mean come on what, a, what an opportunity if you do, you know, if you do something um, that people would do for free and um, get paid for it, you know, play play with guitars, <laughs> go go to gigs. It's, it's, it's talk, a fun way to, to make a living. Talk to guitarists, I mean, amazing, so good. But I did, I, I did need a break at the end of it, and I, I did, I did have a, a, a period away. I was still right. I wrote for for um, other music magazines as a as a freelancer for a while. Um, and did mm-hmm. did kind of write writing work that was totally separate, and it, it probably I probably needed um, five or six years to really um, totally reset how I felt about um, about the industry, and it has been really nice actually coming back in. You know, I did NAM for the first time as a as an exhibitor rather than as a journalist, and doing guitar shows here in the UK and and. Um, sort of three years ago when I start when I, I kind of started in earnest um that was so nice to kind of um meet up again with people I hadn't seen for for a long time and um and kind of renew those acquaintances but actually I mean when I was getting going the, the fact that I still was in touch with people who were who were already established and making things was incredibly useful and um yeah I mean everyone says this but but just just asking other people, "Hey, what do I do about this?" Even the dumbest questions. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's an incredibly um, helpful um, sort of industry that w- that we're in. Um, very, very generous people, and um, and yeah, that re- that really helped me kind of get going, and it kind of gave me the confidence because I, because I, I mean, by that time, I I mean, the, by that time, by the time I I, I really decided I was going to get serious and, and start a full time company. Um, you know, I, I I felt pretty sure that I had um, some stuff that that I couldn't see anywhere else. You know, I had I, I, I had some ideas, some designs that sounded really good and that that were genuinely genuinely going to offer something a bit different. Um, but there's still such a long way from making one good pedal to being able to make a hundred uh, and, yeah. and make them all good and. Um, yeah, I'm still I'm still learning so much. Uh, I feel like this, you know, you, you you it's like shining a torch in the dark. You have these little pools of, of knowledge, surrounded by complete ignorance, and occasionally you manage to join two of them up, and that's an amazing feeling because <laughs> your pool of light gets a bit that, bigger. That is the best. That is one of the best ways I've ever heard that see, that seeking of information and knowledge. Uh, illustrated. That's really. I'm going to steal that one. Oh, please. That's going to be how I explain You're that welcome. in the future. You're welcome. So, 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 th- three years ago, uh, you you start uh, Great Eastern with some designs you'd been kicking around. You've been working on already. When did you first get interested in building circuits? Have you always been? Because uh, it's it's a quick jump from going into journalism to. Uh, sorry, it's a big jump to go from journalism to building guitar pedals. Yeah, absolutely, and. It- I'd always, um, I, I knew I had to solder. I'd always fix my own guitars, doing setups and replacing pickups and soldering switches and stuff. But I think I always felt like um, the the insides of a pedal, particularly the insides of an amp, were just, you know, that's not for you. Don't you don't go any further. <laughs> you can take the screws off and look look, you know, take the panel off and look at it and go, oh those red things look cool, <laughs> but, <laughs> but don't touch it because this is not for you. And that's how I always felt. Right. And then one day I had a, a couple of pedals, I think a Seymour Duncan pickup booster pedal and a, and a weird phaser pedal called a moon phaser that a guy in the UK made. Um, I'm really sorry. I can't remember his name. He used to, he used to be the, the UK agent for um, Robert Keeley. And um, oh, he, he okay. made this amazing um, kind of four-stage phaser that did sort of like three-zero flanges. Anyway, 
had these great pedals yeah. and both of them had stopped working. And I was pretty sure it was just a switch. There's just something wrong with the switches. And, um, and I took the back off them and I thought, look, if I can change a five way switch on a strap, I can change a foot switch on a pedal. So I'm just going to, I'm just going to order some parts. And I'm going to do this. And I did it and it worked. And my pedals, I had my pedals back again. And it, it was like, a, a, you know, the penny dropped. So I thought, well, maybe I, maybe I am allowed to monkey with this stuff. Maybe I can, maybe I can, can figure this out. So that was really the beginning. And then, um, just just learning as much as I could from from as many different people as I could um, about about how things work and and um, it, it was really a process for me of really understanding um, what's happening in in a circuit almost almost in terms of thinking about a, an effects chain on a pedal board so once you can start okay. to identify okay this group of components I recognize the shape of that that looks like an amplifier okay that's making something louder. And, oh, look, at the same time, this is doing some EQ stuff. So, oh, I get that. Oh, and what's this bit doing? Okay, that's something different. And bit by bit, understanding what each of those blocks were. And once you do that, then you can actually start to move them around and find out what that does. And, um, and, and perhaps even go inside one of those blocks to find out what, what changes you can make within them. So right. it's it's a really gradual process of, of kind of getting sucked deeper and deeper in <laughs> to, to this, this fascinating thing. But the, the, I'll tell you the thing that, that really kept me going. And I'm, you know, I'm, I'm kind of still surprised that I've not been put off by how many times things have not worked or things have gone wrong because it's the kind of thing that would usually just make me so mad. <laughs> but yeah. the thing that, that kind of keeps me, interested and makes me think hmm that's interesting that that the last three hours work have resulted in something that doesn't work i wonder why that is <laughs> and and i i think it's because i'm because i'm not a um you know fully trained um, electronic engineer i've not you know they, yeah. those guys learn stuff from from like the physics upwards you know the, their their grounding is is so different um but for me it's still sort of magic that on the one side, I have a bunch of components on a circuit board, and the other side, I have the kind of dynamic, um, you know, musical noise coming out of, of my amp. And I can change something on the component side, and then I can hear this this musical change on the other side. And yeah, the gap of my ignorance between those two things makes it just magic to me. You know, it's it's so so cool. That that I can in a controlled way change something over here on this side, and I can hear that change on the other side coming out of my guitar, and, and when I can feel it when I when I pick, and um, that's that's just so cool. Yeah, it's still a whole lot of magic for me, and um, <laughs> I mean, I've I've gone as far as to like, you know, buy breadboard kits and you know build circuits on a breadboard and. And I, I'm not going to grab it, but, I, you know, put some pedals, to, a couple of kits together. Yeah. And even then, um, I have listeners of this podcast who have tried to explain to me the way this works. And I, I, you got to explain it to me like I'm five, like you got to, you got to break it down. I don't understand. I'd love to, I'd love to understand more, but I long ago decided I'm never going to be a person who starts a pedal company. Cause you're all lunatics. Yeah. Cause there's, there's so many out there, but I love that. I, I mean, as a player, I love that they all exist Yeah, and that you do this, but like you, I have no idea. Like I I'm that, that shadow between the lights for me is really wide. <laughs> and I'm okay with that. Yes I, I, yes. I probably know more than the average guitar player of how it works because I have had people explain it to me and I've done these things, but I'm okay. Not knowing. Yeah. It's just fine. Yeah. I just, I just need to click the button and things work. That's it. That's it. So you, you got these three designs that are out right now. Yeah. Um, uh, and, and they are a little different than, than what you would normally see out there. Um, I've seen a lot of the um, small speaker overdrive uh, on some boards. Um, I've tried and now I can grab it. Um, the, uh, 
the design of drive, which I love that you, you built maybe the most do it all, you know, Jack of all trades drive. Um, haven't seen this one take off as much. I think we talked about that a yeah. little bit. And I, I think that's, I think that's a shame because I've really enjoyed playing with this. I got to play a little, a uh, good bit with it um, on Friday. Um, Cause I was doing a lot of board work, pedal board work, getting ready for a gig that I had yesterday as of when we're recording this. And um, I don't know. It's really, really interesting. I don't know what I expected from the thin to why uh, thin to fat mid the knob that controls the the frequency width um i don't know what i expected from it but it is extremely powerful yeah yeah i i tried it with a strat and just went full fat side and it just it brought a bunch out of my strat that i I don't play it for that reason it doesn't have a lot of that yes uh for me and that really really helped yeah that's that's awesome thank you so much I think that that pedal was really came came out of thinking, uh, you know, learning and understanding why different overdrives sound different. So what is it that makes this overdrive sound different from that overdrive? And and a lot of it is EQ. I mean, clipping is important, but there's not actually that many different ways to clip a signal. And and most of what we hear, and certainly what makes people on forums say, oh, if you've got a Fender amp, get this overdrive. Or, you know, oh, that sounds terrible. Uh, you know, that's that's for Marshalls. This, you know, that's all about EQ, really. And um, yeah. And I kind of thought, hey, why why is, does the pedal designer get to decide this stuff? And then it's, you know, the the, the box, the back goes on the box, and um, you can't you can't touch it. And usually, all you get is a tone control that that doesn't really get it at the stuff you want to get to. You know, by the time you've got it as bright as you want it, it's the, you know, the bass is all gone or it's not, you know, it sounds, well, by, by the time you tamed, you tamed the, the, um, the sharpness you didn't like, um, you've gone too muddy and all this, I kind of thought, why, why is it like this? <laughs> why can we not, why can we not leave these choices open to you so that you can have an overdrive yeah. that will sound good with all your amps and all your guitars and you can change it on the fly. And, what started out as a as a really complicated pedal, it, it was going to have um, all these controls on it to control all these different things. You were going to be able to take the back off, and I I kind of was um, going to put in some um, screw terminals so you could put different diodes in uh-huh. and you know, all this kind of. Uh, I just thought this this is not the kind of pedal I want to use or the kind of pedal I want to make. You know, I don't. I want it to be much easier than this. I want. I don't. You know, the more. The more going on on the pedal, the more chance there is to kind of fret about not having set it right, or you know, I I want I want to just get to to the sound I want and then go back to playing really. So I sort of systematically went through all those features and decided what I didn't really need, um, what wasn't adding that much, what I could actually combine into into um, one control. So the width control does a bunch of different things at the same time. It's it's um, cutting bass, it's moving the mid-range peak around, and it's actually changing gain at the same time. Because obviously, as you uh, bring in more low ends, there's more energy there, and and we perceive it as louder, and and it will drive the amp harder. Yeah. So you have to adjust the gain so that you don't then have to change all the other settings at the same time. And similarly, ed- the edge control, which is the, the high fruits control, is operating is affecting two filters at the same time to kind of give you a, a really useful sweep. So even when it's turned right down, it's not muddy. Even when it's turned right up, it's not shrill. It's just letting you adjust the bit of your tone you want to get to, which is the, the attack and the, and the kind of presence on the top. So, yeah, I, I, yeah, well, I was going to, yeah, just playing through it. Uh, it was, I found it really easy no matter what guitar I was playing or how much gain I needed to to find a really great sound. Whereas sometimes you go, okay, the sound I was looking for, I have to change the pedal entirely. Like this just is too set on, you know, you use a tube screamer. If you don't need want that mid hump, there's nothing you can yeah. do about it. You've got to have a different overdrive entirely. Um, 
I don't know. It's 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 a lot of fun. I'm I'm really excited to spend more time with it because I didn't didn't get as much time with it as I really wanted because I was getting ready for the the gig. But yeah. um, I mean, I I wouldn't I I I wouldn't ever tell anybody that they don't need any other drive pedals. It 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 still has um, a character of its own. It it's mm-hmm. um, probably a little bit more um, sort of dynamic. Uh, in, in terms of the kind of you, you can dig in harder and, and get more drive or, or um, play a bit softer and it cleans up a little bit and it probably goes a bit um, more gritty and distorted than lots of kind of low gain overdrives do. So it, it, it isn't yeah. it isn't like the only overdrive anybody ever needs. What it is 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 a is a drive that um, you know if if you can't. Uh, make the change that you that you hear in your head and you want to you know you, you want to happen with like a, by changing those two knobs then um you know i haven't done my job yeah. right because that that is the biggest thing for me i hate i hate 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 having to work hard to get a good sound out of a pedal and um you know buying pedals that other people have recommended I've, I've found that and then having to i was going to figure out like what why do people like this <laughs> where's the good where's the good sound <laughs> Yeah. I I've certainly found that I if I plug a pedal in and I don't know set some controls set the controls basically so they're not extreme. I don't I'm not one of those person people that's like start everything at noon, but I do like I don't want it at some extreme where it's going to blow up my ears or I won't hear it at all. Actually, I I tend to start with the whatever level control all the way down so that I can turn it on and turn it up, but if I have to spend more than probably 15 seconds finding a usable sound on a pedal i'm going to have a negative feeling about this pedal i don't i don't care what the pedal does i don't care if i have to spend and 15 seconds is a lot longer than you think it is for turning knobs and finding a sound i should be able to get to something usable quickly yeah i I mean i I hate the idea of somebody um, buying one of my pedals which are um, you know, they cost more than lots of other things for lots of reasons. Mm-hmm. I mean, one of them is that I make them all myself. But um, I hate the idea of someone buying one of these pedals and plugging in and not not immediately going, ah, yeah, that's it. Um, and I, w- I would ra- I would rather – I always feel like there's, there's sort of two, two approaches with pedals. There's some people who will um, – you know, like a lot of electromonics pedals I think are a great example where – they give you the whole range, and um, yeah, and that means that you can get some really weird and way out stuff. But it also means that maybe for most people, you know, seventy percent of the range on that control is is kind of they're not ever going to go there, you know. Uh, and I feel like I'm at the f- the far end away from that, where I I hate the idea of someone using my pedals to sound and um, sounding bad. <laughs> I would rather restrict yeah. the range to basically make sure that any way you set the controls is going to sound good. It's going to give you a usable sound that that you can can um, can do something with. But that's um, yeah, that, you know, that's again why there are so many pedal companies because people have very different very different ideas of what constitutes a great pedal. And um, oh, yeah. that's true. And and to be honest, I. I would never tell someone to have one overdrive pedal either. In fact, you should have one of all of them. Yeah. Just in general, yeah. cover your bases, one of all of them. And I don't mean major food groups. I mean, literally <laughs> one of every overdrive pedal. Um, Cause I need uh, makers to keep continuing to be able to make really cool stuff so we can try it out and I can talk to folks about it. Um, so yeah. So move, we'll move on a little bit. Um, Cause you've got, you've had these three designs. You came out with them. I I didn't check the timeline, but they were pretty much all at once. You launched as these three, right? Uh, Is that no, right? I, I, I mean, to be honest, by the time I launched the first one, all three of them were pretty much done. I, I, um, you know, you have your whole life to write your first album. That's um, you know, that's the yes. easy part. Now, I mean, now it's harder because I I'm I have a full time job like making this stuff and. Uh, Developing new stuff is is um, is more difficult, but I, I kind of had all of them ready. But I decided to launch the small speaker overdrive first because I just felt that was the okay. most um, 
it was easy to get the concept and and also the concept was kind of unusual i mean i think i mean you said like the design and drive has not really taken off as it should and um i definitely agree and i think that's definitely my fault because i i've i've made it sound too much of a like a utility pedal you know i should i should have i should have just said to people like here's another great o drive and it sounds awesome here you go rather than saying like this is really (laughs) this is going to be so handy for this situation that situation because i don't think people want useful stuff (laughs) it doesn't it doesn't (laughs) inspire you and and i I think that pedal is super inspiring and i never plug it in without finding a sound i really love and i want to get playing yeah but anyway i think i mean maybe because i kind of knew launching with a pedal like that that's sort of like this is a great pedal for everybody it, it's kind of easy for people to be like yeah yeah blah 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 what well, yeah whatever whereas a small speaker overdrive is like super specific uh you know the, for anybody who doesn't know this is a pedal that's um kind of based on the sound of of like a small amp like a fender champ but specifically the sound like we talked about it's the sound of record is you know yeah, i was i wasn't interested in this you know a, a champ in the room is fine it's okay you know it's um it's it's a it's a fun thing to play with but a champ in a studio close mic so you get a bit of um like proximity effect because kind of the bass reinforcement you get when a microphone's put really close to something and um and that's why that's such a great recording amp because the things that make it not a great amp in the room slightly boxy not a lot of low end, not a lot of high end on a record makes it ideal. So the engineer doesn't have to touch the EQ. The guitar just sits in the mix because it doesn't, you know, it's, it's just perfectly positioned with that nice sort of upper right. mid thing. And, um, and that's something I, I'd known about from back from working for sound on sound, interviewing producers and engineers and hanging out in studios and stuff. And I'd always been really interested in, in that, um, that, small amp thing where where it's it's like the the last amp you probably think it would be uh when you hear this massive guitar sound on a record and it's you know it's it's like a little jump or barber champ or something or like a, a one of the gibson student model amps and I, that was that was sort yeah. of my big idea it's like hey wouldn't it be cool if you could put that in a pedal put that that thing that it does um and i you know i i I like little amps. I like one by tens. I don't. I don't play um, no one by eight uh, amps all that often. But I, I love one by tens, and I love um, single ended amps as well because of that um, that responsiveness and you know the fact there's no there's no sort of point where it tips over from from clean to dirty. It's just a, a smooth um, line, and um, and by yeah. by picking harder or by changing the volume knob you can you can move up and down that line and and so that was the other side so so the two sides of the pedal were were it's it's like the two things that i i'm thinking about all the time in terms of pedals which is like frequency so like where is this going to sit in the mix how is this going to fit in with its intended use right and then dynamics like how how is my how my playing dynamics going to translate into what this pedal does so that i the thing I you know wrote down like this is what this pedal has to do is um, you know do that that sitting in a mix thing that, that a, a champ would do a little amp would do and and then do that dynamic thing that you get from a single ended amp where it's it's just like an extension of your guitar and it's um, it's just a just an effortless thing to play through and so that was my yeah. that was my big idea and I think maybe that's why that pedal has got a small you know some traction with people because yeah that's um hey that's a cool thing right you know who, who doesn't want that <laughs> I, exactly i think it's rad and and there's been a few um there's been a few uh especially recently people trying to emulate that small amp thing but you know for a long time the only pedals you saw trying to emulate anything were emulate big amps when you can't play big amps mm. you know Marshall in a box kind of pedals or you see even in, in the newer technology, we see a lot of things that are like uh, trying to sound like a Vox AC 30 or cause you know, you had one amp and if you wanted that other flavor, you try to get something else. So there's been a lot of that making bigger amps smaller 
but I love the idea of a pedal that's goal is the opposite. We're going to take that little amp and we're going to get that louder for you. We're going to make that, you know, the, a focus sound. Yeah. I really, really like that idea a lot because I loved, I, I, I played through big amps live because I need them to be clean at a certain volume, but I do love just sitting around playing a little five to 10 watt amp and just turning it up Yeah, and just, it, it sounds and feels great. Yeah. To play. The, I mean, the, the, the things I was really list, thinking about listening to when I was developing that were, um, you know, I mean, partly some of the kind of records that famously made, um, you know, some of the seventies Clapton stuff where, where he used the champ or Viber champ or like Mike Campbell from, from the heartbreakers who's one of my, favorite guitarist and I think he used to gig with like a a Princeton yeah like a tweet a small t- tweed amp and a small blackface amp like a tweed Princeton um, yeah and he'd he'd have them um kind of mic'd up in parallel and then that would go through the the stadium PA and that was his that was his guitar sound so cool oh yeah um but yeah it was again really it was listening to the I don't want the sound of the amp I want the sound of the record which is a totally different thing. So I think a lot of those amp emulation pedals, which are fantastic, um, you know, they, they sort of, they look at the circuit of the amp and try and recreate that in, you know, with transistors and, and, um, or, or digitally, which is great. I, I completely didn't do that. I just, the, the inside of the pedal bears no, uh, resemblance at all to the inside of an amp. It, but it, it, yeah. it's, it's finding a different way to get to the to the end result of that that sound and that feel, basically. Yeah, that's and that that's what makes it great. It, it, some people get really wrapped up in oh, this pedal is that amp, just smaller or whatever. I like the idea that you just said, hey, this is what this sounds like. I can get to the get to it this way and make it available. Um, so. Moving on from that, so you you released that one. When does the um, Focus Fuzz and the Designer Drive? The Designer Drive was, was the second one, uh, okay. and then I did the Focus Fuzz, and I I kind of regret that. So the I made two hundred and fifty Focus Fuzzes, so I, I had the germanium transistors to do two hundred and fifty, uh-huh. and uh, when I started out, I had this real thing about um, I I didn't. I didn't want to be the kind of pedal company that just does like that. All their stuff's constantly sold out. I find that really annoying. Work, you yeah. Know? yeah. Um, I now know why they do it. It's a really, really good way to do business. To, <laughs> there's no wasted effort. You make, you make things, you know, yeah. but I didn't, I didn't want to do that, but I wanted to do this Germanian pedal. I had, you know, this was, this was the, the design I had. Um, uh, but I, I kind of said, okay, I'm just doing 250 of these, just doing 250, um, and that's it. And um, I could have, you know, I could have sold twice as many, and they, you know, they went in like 40 hours or something. And I kind of thought, oh, why yeah. did I, why did I say that so definitely? Uh, because then the <laughs> other thing I hate is when people say it's limited edition, and then they, um, then they, you know, say, oh, now, now there's a red one. <laughs> And this is limited edition. Now there's a blue one, and yeah. everyone who bought the first one is like, "What?" <laughs> so, um, <laughs> so I, I kind of regret that a bit. Uh, and uh, so I, 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 produ- I uh, the more recently, I, I did make a silicon version of the pedal that of the Focus Fuzz that that I think sounds very, very close. It's not, I mean, it's not quite the same, but it, it has all the things that made the Focus Fuzz really great. And that one's much cheaper and, and it's available all the time. And I, I want to do more Germanian pedals, um, but they, they will be different. I, yeah. I don't, I, you know, I, I, I totally get that it would be, um, it wouldn't be cool to, to, um, to annoy those, those people who kindly, you know, bought, bought one of the 250 pedals um, by, by doing the same thing again. But th- that pedal is, um, Again, it's it's a pedal I made for myself because uh, I've always been really frustrated that um, I'll see other people playing using a tone bender or a fuzz face, and I think, man, that sounds so good. Uh, you know, I want to try that, and then I'll I'll get one of those pedals, and um, I just it just 
uh, sounds like a big kind of wall of sound coming out of my amp. And um, I just, you know, I can't, I can't do anything with it. It's too much. And, uh, and then you go on forums, you talk to people, they're like, oh, no, no, you need to set your amp this certain way. And like, no, no, you, you've got the wrong kind of amp. You need this and you need to have your guitar volume back to this point. You know? And um, that's, that's, that's cool. And I, you know, in the same way that people go really deep into, into Steve Barry Vaughan's tone or, or, you know, Hendrix or whatever. And yeah. I completely respect that, but I'm not interested in doing that. You know, I, I, I need a pedal that will work with, my amp, how I like to have it set with my guitar that I use for everything else, you know? So again, that was another sort of challenge I set to myself as with design and drive. Can I make a fuzz pedal that, um, I can put into a clean amp and it will make me sound like, um, you know, Jimmy page with his telecaster and his tone bender. And, um, so it's, it's, um, it's definitely on the milder end of the fuzz spectrum. There's loads of guys out there doing amazing, like Death Boy Audio, um, kind of crazy amp melting, face melting fuzzes, <laughs> and that's and there are many, and there, there are many, yeah, yeah, and they're super cool. But that that was definitely not what I wanted to do. So it really is. Um, I think it sort of picks up about where you describe overdrive or distortion. And it, it goes from there to to sort of uh, vintage fuzz and stops. Mm-hmm. And I think there's yeah. loads of really cool, usable, interesting sounds in that spectrum that we don't usually get because, um, and I know why people do it, but when when you say fuzz pedal, people want it to be insane, oh, mega fuzz, and and then they don't use it because. <laughs> Because it's basically unusable, so it's too yeah. much. It's just too yeah. much. So, so the the focus buzz is um, the, the the sort of unique thing about it is uh, the focus control is is like an extra gain stage on the front of the, the the fuzz stage, and as you increase gain, it's also kind of cutting bass. So, you know, on um like on a, a treble booster something like the you know the Keeley one or the um Catlin bread yeah. uh Naga Viper uh all these pedals where you have a, a control that's usually called range and what that is right. is you've got like a um small capacitor and a bigger capacitor and uh it lets you go from the small capacitor which cuts loads of bass to the big one which cuts less. Uh but again as you make that switch generally as you go to the small capacitor so more treble, less bass. You also lose volume right. at the same time, and it's really annoying. Oh. So this, on the, in the focus fuzz, as you as you go more treble, less bass, you also get more gain. So you're making up that volume, yeah, loss, yeah, yeah, perceived volume loss that you're getting. And what happens is when it turned down, it's it's like a kind of warm, warmer, sort of woolier fuzz, and then turning up that focus knob, it's like. Uh, you know, putting the, the thrusters on because you, as you're, as you're getting less bass and more treble and more definition, you're also getting a, a bucket load more gain. Uh, so at the other end of the extreme, it's, it's that kind of tone bendery thing, like super focused, um, fuzz. And, uh, and yeah, that, you know, when I kind of got that right, I was like, Oh, this is, yeah, this is, <laughs> This has got to, this has got to be on the pedal. It's got to be the name of the pedal because it's it's such a cool thing and it, it's very simple, but it's it isn't something anyone else has done, um, and it's the kind of thing that uh, I I sort of secretly get a bit frustrated with uh, lots of pedals that I see. Whereas um, it's great to have options, you know, clipping switches and things that give you different diodes, different levels of clipping, and but. It, it really isn't that hard to also compensate for the for the drop in level at the same time like it's yeah it really isn't hard to do and and nobody does it and I find it really annoying like wouldn't it be more useful if I could change clipping character without like I like the the, the full the full drive uh you know you go you yes. go to like no no clipping diodes and uh uh-huh. and it's just it's just like full up amp going it's yeah. It's a lot. It's like, real loud. It, 
it isn't difficult to 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 achieve closer to unity between those options but but nobody does it and i i, <laughs> I don't really know why because it'd be so much more useful uh so yeah it, it would uh, the full drive is a great example of where i I basically only used one setting on it because the others were just so different and, and got so loud. Um, I can't remember now which one I used. Um, there was also on that one, there was a weird thing, the way the, the volume levels were on those settings that the boost didn't really, the boosts out of the pedal didn't actually boost volume. It just added more, more overdrive mm. to the mm. pedal. And so I would, whichever setting I used was the one where the boost actually would act as a boost. Cause it was the only overdrive on my pedal yeah. board. So I needed it to do that, but that's what I mean about your pedals. And I, I don't, I don't see anybody out there doing anything the way you're doing yeah. these. I mean, there are some others doing something around the, the small speaker thing a little bit, not, not much, yeah, sure. but no, no one's approaching them the way you're, you're doing it. Um, which is, is one of the things I like, and it's really hard to do in at this point in the pedal industry because it feels like everything's been done. Yeah. I get surprised anytime someone comes out with something unique anymore. Yeah, and I and I'm I'm really not as I said, I'm not into exploring the extremes of what guitar uh, can can do, you know. <laughs> I'm not interested yeah. in the outer limits. I, I like really good classic guitar tones you know there's there's a reason why we all keep coming back to the same sort of touchstones for 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 great sounds and and why those those guys are still touring in their into their 80s and stuff um it's because that's that's how most of us want the guitar to sound and um yeah so so yeah how do you find new stuff within while while still basically making the sounds that everybody has always wanted and I, I think one way to do it is is to um, is to make sure that it that you just don't have to think about it that that um, by just spending a little bit more time at trying to get the the, re- the range of the controls right, trying to just tweak and test and tweak and test and and just try and get it to a point that you can just plug in and get the sound you want and go, and then that that becomes uh, a really fun and inspiring thing because I mean, why, what are we doing when we're buying pedals? If not trying to buy a little box of inspiration that we're going to open up, it's going to make us want to play that, that at the end of the day is what you you want it to do. So I think that's, yeah, that's what I'm thinking about a lot. Like I need to be able to just plug this in, stomp on it, feel like a a rock star and, and go. (laughs) Get that dopamine hit yeah. for the day. Just get yeah, get your head in a yeah. right. I see. I I think of it the same way. Like I I have a bunch of pedals on a shelf, like a ton of people who do these podcasts and it's a whole thing. But um, I I also have like two or three pedal boards put together at any time. And the one of the best things that keeps me playing guitar is I walk in and I look at a pedal. I haven't played that in a while. I want to play that. Sit there, plug it in. And you get this inspiration from a pedal. And I like that. I like that approach to it a lot mm. that you're just trying to create little pockets of inspiration for players, something they really enjoy using and playing and it gets you playing guitar. Cause that's the ultimate goal. Yeah. Play more guitar. Yeah. But what I've learned from the, from the designer drive experience is really, um, don't, you know, I, I don't think I will try to, to kind of chase the, the middle anymore. I think, it, as a as a small company, and to be honest, I like being a small company. I'm not in a hurry to to become a big one and to employ lots of other people. But I think, uh, yeah, maybe I will go more more niche in the future. Explore uh, smaller avenues of, of things that are fun and, and and inspiring, and and um and probably if it's if it's fun for me, uh, listening to it for the hundredth hour of 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 going backs and forwards <laughs> between different prototypes if i'm still plugging in and finding it fun then it's got to be fun for for some other people um surely somewhere (laughs) (laughs) well i like it i like that a lot well um i think that's a great place to uh to wrap up as we 
uh, come uh, come up on the hour mark. Sorry, I'm losing words here. Uh, come up on the hour mark. So we're going to wrap up here. David, where can everybody find Great Eastern Effects on the internet? Yeah, our website's um, greateasterneffects.com. So that's Great Eastern and the letters fx.com. Um, and you'll find us there. And, awesome. and we, you know, we're on Instagram at Great, Great Eastern Effects, uh, YouTube, all the usual places. Um, but please, yeah, come and say hi, send me messages, tell me what to do. I'll, yeah, be, be very happy <laughs> to hear from you. Awesome. Well, all of those links are down in the description below. Y'all be sure to click all of those. Uh, Dave and I are about to wrap up here, but we're going to head over and record an episode for Patreon. If you want to hear more from David and uh, and me, I guess, uh, you can sign up for the Patreon over at patreon.com slash 40 watt podcast or for five dollars a month less than a cup of coffee in some places uh you can get an extra episode every time a regular episode drops of 40 watt podcast in the meantime david thanks for coming on i really appreciate you coming on hanging out talking pedals uh yeah thank you so much absolute pleasure yeah all right well listeners until uh till you hear from me again y'all be sure to uh be good to yourself be kind to each other and make some noise This episode is brought to you by the supporters of 40 Watt Podcast over on Patreon. Go over to patreon.com slash 40 Watt Podcast, where for as little as $3 per month, you can help support the podcast and get every episode ad-free. For $5 a month, you'll get every episode ad-free, as well as a bonus episode every week. I can't overstate how thankful I am for the support of my patrons, and hope you'll consider joining the team and helping keep this show on the road.